Hey, welcome to Grace Note Recordings. If this is your first time here, we're glad to have you part of this community. Last year, I converted an old tube radio into this 5C2 Fender Princeton chassis, and today we're going to finally put this project to rest. If you want to watch the videos on the electronics of the build, go ahead and click up here. And once you're back, make sure to watch until the end because I hit a unique Easter egg in this amp that amp lovers are going to enjoy. One of the biggest obstacles creatives face is releasing a creation into the world and calling it finished. Fear and perfectionism often drive the bus and can easily steer us off the path to completion. In regards to this amp, the chassis has been sitting back on the shelf for the past year or so, and since then I've always considered it finished. I had successfully converted an old tube radio into a guitar amp that was playable, it sounded good, but it always stared back at me with irresolution. While it was technically a playable amp, it was hard to move around and frankly it was dangerous and irresponsible to have out when guests were around because of all the exposed shock hazards. So while it is healthy to get proficient at the skill of releasing art, my labeling this project completed was simply lazy. It was like releasing an 8 bar chord loop and calling it a song. It has no melody, no structure, and it provides you little value. So we gave this amp the components it needed to be complete and functional. I'm going to be fully transparent about this build, what I liked and what I would do differently. I definitely made some mistakes and I want to do everything I can to prevent you from making the same mistakes I did. This is the first build I did in this style with the stained solid wood enclosure and I'm going to keep this amp in my studio, so I took some risks with different build techniques. While most of the risks paid off, there were some things I do differently and techniques I need to refine for future builds. The inspiration for the design came from the original wide panel Princeton 5C2 amps available in 1954 and 1955. While I'm not going to dive into the history, I'll link some useful pages down below if you're interested. Since the enclosure is going to remain exposed, the joinery plays a key role in the overall look. After comparing a lot of different styles, I ended up going with these half-blind dovetails. In my opinion, these look more professional than traditional dovetails because it inherently hides the dovetails from the top face of the box. Also, these are popular joints used in vintage solid wood furniture, so it added to the overall vibe I was going for. This dovetail jig is really useful. They are a bit complex, but the instruction booklet is clear and there are hundreds of tutorials on YouTube to make it even easier. I'll link it down below for you to check out. And this is where I made my first mistake. I used the factory end of this board on one of my joints, thinking that I'd sand it or route it down far enough to hide the pitting. Unfortunately, we can still see the deep pitting on the final product, and I don't like the way it looks. Even after filling the pits in with CA glue and sawdust, they're still visible. I'll show you the other joints for reference. If this amp were meant for anyone other than me, I'd feel like this result was inadequate. So next time I'll be sure to trim the factory end before cutting it down to length. For the front, I first measured the size of the chassis front panel and made the board opening match. When cutting out the opening with the jigsaw, I failed to recognize how weak those two ears were, so I accidentally broke one of them off. Luckily, the break was clean enough to simply glue back together without wasting this piece. I ended up finishing the cutout by hand, but in the future, I'm considering creating a routing template to make this process go much faster. At this point, with the front still separate from the enclosure, I used the router to round the inside edge of the front panel and the outside edges of the enclosure with matching radii. Then I finished filling in all the knots with CA glue and sawdust and then sanded everything down smooth. In order to attach the front to the enclosure, I carefully placed two backing strips on the inside of the box. then use brad nails to secure the front to these backing strips. And now it's starting to look like a real amp. Behind final assembly, seeing the grain pop with that first coat of stain was the most rewarding part of this build. 
I used a combination of stain and satin polyurethane. While I was originally going for a lighter stain to allude to the tweed coverings of the original, I didn't have enough in stock to finish the entire enclosure. So I had to go with this darker stain instead, but the results still came out great. I'm not going to explain my full finish process, just follow the directions on whatever product you're using. If you're going for a more vintage look like I am here, I recommend applying all of your clear finish coats with the brush, which just leaves a subtle feeling of character. If you're going for a more modern finish, however, then I recommend applying the final finish coat with aerosol. The glossier the finish, the greater the difference will be between these two techniques. This is just another tool you can apply to shape the overall character of your build. With the finish left to dry for a couple days, I got to work on the front panel plate, which was by far my favorite part of this build. The Sharpie was cool, but I wanted to experiment with engraving black acrylic with my laser engraver. So I bought these 3mm sheets on Amazon, cut them down to size, and began designing in Lightburn, which is the program I use for my engraver. Nothing crazy here, just a tone knob with an integrated on-off switch, a volume knob, and an input jack. But one detail I discovered halfway through is that back on these original amps, the knobs were numbered 1 to 12 instead of 1 to 10, so I had to fix that in the program. Luckily, this software makes seemingly complex tasks, such as aligning these numbers around a central point, really easy with just a click of a mouse. Once everything was labeled, I used the remaining space to identify the circuit of this amp. I debated whether or not to put the Princeton name on here, which I'm sure you're aware is trademarked and is something I take very seriously. But ultimately, I'm not selling or giving away this amp, and I didn't change the circuit in any significant ways. Definitely not enough to put my name on it. So I feel this is appropriate. If you disagree, I invite you to comment below so we can have that conversation. I'm extremely happy with the results of this front plate, however one improvement I want to make for future builds is to fill this etch with nail polish or paint or something in order to make it easier to read. Unfortunately, this feature is still with the R&D department. <sighs> Once the plate cover was installed, all that was left was final assembly. And this is where I hid the unique Easter egg that I mentioned earlier. If you're at all familiar with tube amps, you know that they all include a tube chart, which identifies specific information about the amp, such as the serial number and the tube placement. I think the inclusion of this tube chart ties the project together and tells the deeper story of how this amp came to be by conversion of a 1947 GE Model 326 phonograph. If you want to know more about this process or any other process I use throughout this video, please let me know down in the comments below. If you like this build, hit the like button down below and consider subscribing to follow this and other projects in my home studio. Thanks for watching.